Aliens Fireteam Elite is a PvE three-person co-op shooter that plunges you headfirst into the Aliens universe as you take on xenomorphs and synths, but have fans of the series had their fill of squashing bugs and cheesy 80s-inspired dialogue, or will a new studio filled with industry vets win over the next generation of Colonial Marines. Hey there friends, it's Kodiak here, one half of the team behind Legacy Gaming, and today we dive in to find out if Aliens Fireteam Elite is worth your time. Before we get too far, Livin and I would like to thank Cold Iron Studios for providing us with an early copy of Aliens Fireteam Elite. As we often say, playing the game even just a few days early is a huge help for two guys that are still trying to balance full-time jobs, so a big thank you to them. If you didn't catch our Aliens Fireteam Elite Ultimate Preview video, that's alright, let me take you back to the beginning. The game is touted as a PvE three-person co-op shooter. You can play as one of five classes as you fight your way through Aliens-inspired levels, killing enemies, and completing simple objectives. If you need another game to parallel it to, think Third Person Left 4 Dead or World War Z set in the Aliens-inspired world, and you'll be right on track. The game is damn fun, so let's just get that out of the way right now. Missions break down into neat 20-30 to 30 minute bites, which is perfect for people that don't have hours to spend in a game and the callbacks to the origins of the series will no doubt excite Alien fans. To be totally transparent with you all, I'm not an Aliens person. I had some fun playing Aliens vs Predator growing up, but outside that, I'm a casual fan of the series. Livid, on the other hand, is a diehard, which is why we always tackle these reviews together. You know, two heads are better than one and all that jazz. What I do know is gameplay, and that's really where I want to start today. As I mentioned a minute ago, there are five classes in the game. The Gunner is a straightforward soldier with solid offensive capabilities that has access to a team-wide buff and grenade. The Demolisher is your team's heavy weapons expert, capable of wielding the iconic smart gun, as well as having access to some valuable CC and rockets. The Technician is all about team support, and while they're perfectly capable of killing enemies, their turret and slow traps are fantastic in team play. The fourth baseline class, the Doc, does what you'd expect, providing medical support to your team in the form of group AoE heals, as well as providing them some combat enhancements via a buff. And the final class is the Recon, and it's unlocked once you complete a full playthrough of the campaign. It's a specialist, capable of spotting targets, restoring ammunition, and providing some health back on hit, things that the harder difficulties will essentially outright eliminate at the base level. Across the board, each class feels great and falls nicely into their specific niche while still managing to cross over and be effective no matter the situation. Playing with a friend or two really does make the classes come to life. For example, during our initial playthrough, Livid was rocking the Demolisher while I was playing a Gunner. Anytime an Elite came crashing through, I knew he would use his ability to knock them down, then I'd pop our group buff and we'd light them up. Those types of moments are created by the class relationships, and they're a heck of a lot of fun, especially when you lock in with your teammates. However, if you do plan on playing solo, that's fine. Just know that the AI-controlled synth won't be able to really hold their own. They're fine in the campaign if playing on the default difficulty, but as soon as you ratchet things up, they become a serious liability. Before we get into a match, however, we have to talk about all the magic between the action, because this is the foundation for your experience within the game. Players can choose any class they want between missions. Classes dictate abilities like we talked about before, but they also determine which weapons a player can use. Rifles, heavy weapons, handguns, and close quarter weapons are unlocked through missions and purchased from the armory aboard the Endeavor. Throughout the game, it genuinely felt like there were plenty of options to test out. Everyone's going to gravitate to a specific weapon or playstyle, and we always felt like there was a weapon to fit that need. The more you use a weapon, the more you level it up, which rewards players who stick to their guns. Literally. That extra 5% accuracy or 10% stability may seem silly to a casual fan, but for players that plan on checking out the game's horde mode, ramping up the difficulty, and even activating the harder challenge cards, this becomes essential. You could also further improve your guns by unlocking or purchasing attachments. Other than the sniper scope, these don't necessarily change your playstyle, but the beefy passive benefits are definitely required as the action starts to ramp up. Since we're talking about difficulty, I want to make sure I get this information out there because it was something a lot of people asked about during our preview. There are, in fact, multiple difficulties in the game. Extreme and Insane mode are unlocked after you beat the main campaign, and they are absolutely ruthless. 
Enemies are no longer highlighted, hence why you need the Recon class. Ammo is more sparse, enemies can one-shot you if they catch you off guard. Overall, it's pretty much what you'd expect if you sent three marines into an alien hive. A suicide mission. I'm not saying that to deter anyone either. People love a challenge, and I want to make sure everyone knows there is challenge to be had here. With just a few more preparations, we're ready to dive into the action. Each player can assign consumables, things like turrets, special ammunition, and mines that they can bring on missions. At the onset, you can only assign two, but you find a small handful during each run. Anything you don't use, you keep, and can be brought along in the future. The final piece of the puzzle are the perks. Using a grid-style system, you can mix and match bonuses that improve your overall performance in combat or augment specific abilities and perks, sometimes drastically changing them in the process. The more you play and level up, the more choices you have when trying to fill out the grid. Personally, I love grid-style talent systems. They feel unique, and while a few other games have utilized a similar system, I feel like this departure from the more traditional talent tree is fantastic. With all of that out of the way, it's time we pivot and talk about the action. I won't lie, there's a healthy bit of prep work that goes into the lead up to a mission, but it's worth it. And just like with all things, you get faster and more efficient with your prep the more often you do it. It's all essential though, because the combat, well, the combat is pretty damn entertaining. Each campaign is broken into three missions. Times that by four campaigns, and you're looking at 12 maps broken across four different environments. As I said in the intro, each mission will take you somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes, depending on your skill and the difficulty the game is set at. It's the perfect balance of content per time invested. Any longer, and it'd feel like a slog. Any shorter, and you wouldn't get that sense of accomplishment. The moment-to-moment -moment action is where the game really shines. There is no better experience than facing down a horde of xenomorphs as they run along walls and ceilings, angling for the kill. And sure, most diehard Alien fans will argue lore-accurate aliens wouldn't just funnel down single paths, and you'd be correct, but that doesn't make it any less fun. When your back's against a wall, there are only a few things you can rely on, and the game truly reaches its peak when you're just on the cusp of being overrun, and you somehow manage to fight your way back from the jaws of defeat. Sadly, you can only do that so many times before the thrill wears off, and once that happens, there's little that evolves the experience to keep things feeling fresh. Don't get me wrong, mowing down hundreds of Xenos is great, and that does never get old, but after a point, you just kind of want more. The developers try and inject some intensity into the action by introducing bigger, badder enemies, like the classic Warriors and Praetorians, and even some new additions, but even these fail to change the experience up in any meaningful way. Are they scary baddies capable of ripping you limb from limb? Absolutely. But do they fundamentally change the game? Not really. I want to be clear, that sense of wanting more doesn't come from a place of anger or frustration. We want more because we really enjoy the foundation of the game. The loop is solid, the action crisp, we were just hoping it would evolve in some way as we pushed further into our adventures. Here's the good news. Cold Iron Studios has already said they have big plans for post-launch content, which will include all new free content. Anything new implemented into the game will be entirely free, while additional paid content will be purely cosmetic. Now, my griping aside, there are still plenty of high points. First and foremost is the action. No matter what gun you choose to use, it'll be capable of killing enemies. Are they all created equal? Absolutely not. But factor in your perk trees and class kits, and it's a pretty solid balance across the board. Obviously, this is less of a factor in a PvE game, but it's still important to point out. Second is the world, and man did they nail the aesthetic. From the claustrophobic corridors and massive reactor rooms aboard space vessels, to the ancient temple architecture and organic flowing engineer structures, each mission feels like it's part of the Aliens universe. Again, as a casual fan, this is important. As Livid reminded me multiple times throughout our playthrough, not everything lines up exactly with the Aliens universe established by the movies, and the horror vibe could definitely be leaned into harder, but there's enough there for true fans to latch onto to get them hooked. Whether it's crawling through a dilapidated orbital refinery, exploring some ancient engineer runes, or venturing into the heart of the hive, each campaign feels distinctly different, and that's important considering there are only 12 missions at this point. Remember, you'll be playing those missions multiple times as you ramp up the difficulty or farm for gear, so getting those right is crucial. One aspect of the game we didn't have access to during our original preview period was the Horde mode, and man oh man, there is a lot of potential here.
Talk about true to form. This is the movie experience tailor-made for video games. A small crew of colonial marines hunkered down trying to survive an onslaught of xenomorphs. The action is intense and just hits different compared to the linear campaign missions. I also think there's a lot of potential here. As we were playing, Livid and I were backseat developing, talking about a COD zombie style system where players had to upgrade guns on the fly rather than go in with pre-built loadouts and wish there were just more dynamic elements to explore. There's a lot the developers can do here, and while there is only one playable map at launch, it's clear there are plans to expand this further down the line. For anyone curious, Horde Mode is a great place to try out new guns, experiment with different perk grid combinations, and really put your loadouts and team comp to the test, as the longer you survive, the better the rewards. I should also touch on challenge cards, since they play a big part in keeping the game interesting. Challenge cards can only be used at the start of a mission. They're variables that change up the action, sometimes in small ways, other times substantially. For example, a challenge card can force you to use a full magazine before you reload. Not terrible. Other cards will upgrade certain common enemies into more elite versions, then multiply them. Terrifying. There are even ones that render all but your dinky sidearm useless, and you can only imagine how hectic those missions become. Challenge cards keep it interesting when you want to change things up, and it's a system I can see them expanding post-launch as it's simple yet effective. There's a lot to enjoy with Aliens Fireteam Elite, but we wouldn't be doing our jobs as reviewers if we didn't talk about some of the things that hold the game back. Character customization is definitely lacking, and I mean big time. It's just a basic system with very few options, and while it's possible to create a character that feels like your own, it's nowhere near the gold standard. We know that both unlockable and paid cosmetics will be the focus here to make your character stand out, but we just wish the character creator was a bit more robust. Second is the story, which never really solidifies into anything meaningful. You're guided through each mission by floating voices with incredibly cheesy dialogue. Yes, this is by design and meant to be an homage to the corniness of action-adventure movies of the 80s, but after a while it starts to wear on you. That isn't to say the lore crafting isn't on full display outside in another way. Back aboard the Endeavor, if you've picked up hidden intel items inside each mission, or just completed something for the first time, you'll be greeted by some solid dialogue moments from the various NPCs. This is where I personally learned more about Xenomorphs, our mission, and a ton of background on what's going on in the universe. Even Livid found some of this lore really enjoyable. It is a nice break from the action, and the voice acting here is a bit more fleshed out than those mid-action one-liners. I also briefly want to touch on the audio, and while we don't usually talk about this in our reviews, in this case, it's important. Casual Alien fans will see really no issue with everything, for the most part. The music in each level takes repeated cues from the films and makes you feel that much more immersed in the world. The weapons, however, they sound just okay. I wasn't really bothered by this because, again, super casual Aliens fan, but Livid was quite annoyed. The classic pulse rifle is lacking that distinct punchiness it has in the films. It's a small nitpick, but we know this matters to a decent chunk of people who will choose to pick up the game. Finally, and I know we talked about this a bit before, but it's that lack of diversity in the gameplay. Like I said, the loop is solid, but it never changes, and this becomes apparent after so many hours with the game. The formula is exactly the same mission to mission. Long open hallways, leading into big encounter areas, kill some enemies, move into the next hallway, and eventually you end at some end game room where you have to survive a massive onslaught. Each mission plays out virtually the same as every other horde shooter in the genre, and while the action is rock solid, we were just hoping for some more unique mechanics or curveballs along the way. So to wrap this baby up, let's break it all down. Aliens Fireteam Elite is a solid game, and for Cold Iron Studios' first project, I'd say they've done a great job. This certainly isn't another Colonial Marines, and thank God for that. The foundation is there, and I think most people that enjoy a good Horde game will feel right at home with this title. Casual Alien fans will love it. Hardcore fans might grumble about this, that, and the other thing, but overall, I think they'll like it too. However, it's not a perfect game, and along the way, there are a few stumbles, from the lackluster character creation to the general repetitiveness that weighs down the experience. That being said, for the very smart price of $40, both Livid and myself do still think the game is worth your time, and with the promise of more free content in the future, it's a solid investment to anyone's video game library, especially if you have some buddies.
If you all enjoyed this video, we'd love some support. We're chasing our year-end goal of 150,000 subscribers, so if you love video games and you want more in-depth reviews and fresh content in your feeds almost every day, please consider hitting that thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. It's still the single best way to help channels like ours reach new audiences. We also invite you to join us on Discord. We've got a great community of around 7,000 members, so check out the link in the description to join today. Finally, if you like everything we stand for here at Legacy Gaming and you want to support us even more, you can now do so by becoming a member. For just a couple bucks, you're helping evolve the channel and take our community to that next level. Check out the join button below to learn more. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching and play on.